So every year we honor a single former graduate of the college who has made career distinctions and contributions uh, that, that, that really transcend the field. One of you likely in that audience is, will receive, receive this award. Governors have received this award. Distinguished researchers have received this award. People who have truly impacted lives and changed systems. Yet, of all our past awardees, uh, I can really actually think of no one more deserving than this awardee. And this is Ed Taylor, uh, Vice Provost and Dean of Undergraduate Academic Affairs at the University of Washington. Ed's also our keynote speaker, and as he begins and ends in speech, you'll see why. But I'm going to say some nice things about Ed, because, because he deserves it. Ed joined the University of Washington College of Education as a faculty, as an assistant professor in 1995, and since then has been a leader in teaching the moral, historical, and ethical dimensions about what it means to live in a good and just society. And in so doing, Ed has built relationships with people on our campus, people in the community, and people nationally that so embody what I think we believe a college of education should be doing. Ed is one of these rare, rare people who truly um, walks the walk. He, he, in so many ways, I think, inspires this entire campus and entire region to push itself to accomplish what it can in terms of improving the lives of children. And without further ado, uh, I'm going to let Ed take the podium and uh, just enjoy what he has to say. And so, Ed, on behalf of the faculty, uh, we really commend you for all your distinction and all the honor you brought upon us as a graduate. I have the letter that Tom sent me on, on my desk, and, and I read it carefully. And, I, I really, if, if anything, I, I feel like I try to go each day and, and live up to, to the expectations of, of my colleagues um, sitting on this on this podium and live up to the expectation of, of so many of our of our students that are out in the community doing such good things. So I'm, I'm grateful and honored to be among people that I respect so much. My idols are on this stage, really. A colleague of mine told me that this is not the time to be self-deferential and say that I don't deserve this award because it then draws the attention to me, which is not the point of, of this. So I'm actually going to go the other direction and I'm going to say a couple things about another award that I received. <laughs> this is not the first. I'm like Monty, I'm no stranger to awards. I, I, about eight years ago, I was inducted into my high school hall of fame, Mount Oak High School. I got a call from a former teacher of mine. I was sitting in my office. I'd just become the dean and vice provost. And, and in the first week, and former teacher Mr. Ellison called. He taught, he taught math, and he taught science, and he taught history. He was a wrestling coach and, and a basketball coach. And on the weekends, he worked in a head shop downtown. Now, for those of you who don't know what a head shop is, it just simply means you didn't grow up in the 70s in either California or Washington or Oregon. <laughs> Mr. Ellison, and this, this is the conversation he, we had. He, he called and he said, Eddie, we haven't seen you in a while. Um, and I'm not teaching anymore. I'm, I'm still working in the store. He said, oh, it's a store now. <laughs> we sell groceries there. And he said, you know, I'm on, but I'm on the committee to, for, for the Hall of Fame in, induction for Lompoc High School. And I, I said, wonderful. I actually put him on speaker so I can close my office door because I wanted to hear everything he had to say. And he said, you know, we gathered and we, and we, we thought for a bit, and, and old Calvin's name came up. We were going to nominate Calvin. But, you know, Calvin had that problem with, with weapons, you know, and he, he's, in, he, he's been in federal prison, and, and, and he's been in there about six or seven years. And I said, you know, it's always good for them to be out when you give them the award. <laughs> He said, you remember old, old Shelley? I said, oh, yeah. You know, Shelley started hearing voices. She had some difficulty. And, and he said, and I quote, that schizophrenia kind of got to her. And I said, yeah, I followed Shelley. It was close to her. He went on. <laughs> he, he said, you remember Rocky? Rocky 
went surfing one night and they and they found a surfboard but couldn't find Rocky. They searched for a while and searched for a while. There's a memorial out at Palama Beach for, for Rocky. And he went on. He said, you know, Malcolm was driving his beetle and he had an accident. And I said, you know, Mr. Ellison, I, I, um, I hate to interrupt, but do you have a question for me? <laughs> and he said, oh, you know, he said, so what, yes, Annie, what have you, what have you been up to? And I, I he, he asked me, are you, are you, we haven't seen you since you left town. Are you, are you still playing? I said, Mr. Ellison, a, a, a funny thing happened to me on the way to the Coliseum. I, I left Montpolk and I, I went. I went to school. I went to school in the Northwest called Gonzaga, and I. And I and <laughs> there's Zags in the house. I, I read. I, I, I read things for the first time. We didn't read books in high school. I read for the first time. The first text I, I got was was Dietrich Bonhoeffer's letters and papers from prison. I struggled, I struggled, I struggled with that text. It was about, it was about freedom. This is a German theologian writing from German Nazi camp. And his convictions eventually cost him his life. And I thought it was fascinating for people, for someone to die for their convictions. I just thought that was fascinating. The second class I, I took, same semester, was a statistics class. I, I didn't do so well. Something about chi-square analysis kind of caught me up. So I took it a second time. Same teacher, same, same class, I took it the next semester. Because I, I just wanted to understand. We, we read deeply, we read Ralph Ellison, Invisible Man, I'm an Invisible Man, no, I'm not a spook like those who haunted Edgar Allan Poe, nor am I one of your Hollywood movie ectoplasms. I'm a man of substance, flesh, and bone. I might even be said to possess a mind. I'm invisible simply because people receive, refuse to see me. I just thought reading deeply text was so powerful. Love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Do I dare to eat a peach? I heard the mermaids singing. Each to each. I told them that I went on, I told them the short version of this, I went on to do a, a PhD at, at the University of Washington in College of Education, and I studied with incredible scholars. Learned about what constitutes evidence. Learned about different types of schools, that working class schools do something different than elite schools. Learned something about even the school that I went to. Reading ranged from the historical reconstruction of knowledge about race, transformative teaching, learned about the Tinker versus Des Moines case from faculty member who's on the stage right now, most influential free speech case in this country. Then I had the great honor of going on and teaching pre-service teachers and, and principals in the Danforth program and superintendents. I was really fortunate that my colleagues trusted me enough to teach in the very programs that you're in now, I gave Mr. Ellison a shorter version of that story about what I've done. <clears throat> and there was silence on the other end of the phone, kind of a, an odd silence. And he said, that, that's all good, but I ask you, are you still playing? <laughs> he wanted to know if I went on to play pro ball, and I, I, I said, no, I stopped after college, but I'm, but I'm doing okay. <laughs> now I don't I don't blame Mr. Ellison for being underwhelmed by me because he was about a decade older than, than me because he came from that era you know this was the by the time we got the Woodstock we were half a million strong that that was him Tim Soldiers and Nixon's coming were finally on our own he he was from that group and in fact he did go to Woodstock where he would have heard the who we're not going to take it. Joe Cocker, a little help from my friends. That that was that was him. They they were they were struggling for for something. So 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 as he was teaching us, I think he was a little underwhelmed when Casey and the Sunshine Band hit the top of the charts with shake 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 your your booty. <laughs> and in that same year, they hit the top of the charts with I'm your boogeyman. That's what I am. I think he was underwhelmed with the debates about which one of us was going to be Starsky and which one of us was going to be Hutch. I think he stopped teaching the third Casey and Sunshine Band hit, and then he went on to work in the head shop full time. 
let me just say there will probably be graduation speeches all around the country, but I suspect that none of them will have mentioned Casey and the Sunshine Band <laughs> twice. But I'm still your distinguished graduate, so it's a little tough to take it back now. I think about, and I'm actually a little haunted by Calvin and Sheldon and Matthew and the others, but we, we are 5% of the world's population in this country and we are 25% of the prisoners in this country. African Americans and Hispanics make up 58% of the prison population, Calvin's one of them. Approximately 50% of students aged 14 and over, if they have mental illness, 50% of them drop out of school. Shelley's not an anomaly. This is not a time to go into, into dismal statistics about what happens to young people. And, and, and I can. There's some problematic things that are, that are going on. Let me just say that the Calvin, Shelley, Malcolm, and Rocky are, are not anomalies. I, I get that they, that they struggle. The stories also aren't a, a mystery to, to, to me. I, I knew Calvin well. I grew up with, with him. I, I knew Rocky really, really well. He surfed every single day of his, of his life up until he was 50. If he was surfing at night, he wasn't really surfing. Something else happened to, to Rocky. I, I knew that Shelley had problems along the way, but I also know that in caring in decent communities, the people surround those folks and make diagnosis and we provide care. So if Shelley was alone when she struggled, there was a reason for that. We weren't naive. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm any more deserving than any more of my classmates. And Mr. Ellison could have gone on and listed more and more and more. I'm not sure that there was a top that he was looking for. He kept looking for who the highest achievers were. And he, couldn't, and he was reaching to the top shelf and he couldn't find anything there. So he found me. I'm not giving any special value to, to my achievements. But, but here's the, the difference. There isn't a roadside memorial there for me, but there is for, for them. I, I don't like them. They're not very attractive. They're not very appealing. Those little balloons and those little flowers that sit on the side of the road, there are too many of them in my hometown. There are too many of them in Seattle. Just too many. And I'm still in the struggle. That, that's, that's the honor that I have. I'm, I'm still in it. So there's hope here because tassels are going to be turned today by the time you walk across this stage. And as you turn those tassels and as you go on, some first grade child is, is, is going to read and go on this path. Because you turned your tassels, because you engaged in this work, some adolescent girl is going to go on to full adulthood. Because, and when you turn this tassel, because you did, some young man or some young woman who never believed they were going to college is going to end up sitting in a chair just like yours. Books will be written because you've turned these tassels and hypotheses will be tested. Because you turned this tassel and you went back into the community, some young man or some young woman who's on 23rd in Jackson right now is going to live a full adult life because you intervened. Some logger who lost his job a decade ago is going to find work because you found your way into places like Bellingham Technical College. Some, some baby with autism Perhaps even tomorrow, my guess is that tomorrow, that some father is going to fall apart at the moment that that baby says her first words, which is, Dad. Talk to my colleagues at the EEU about that. Martin King once was asked why he continues to march. The, the, the march that is symbolic, symbolic of the very thing that we're about to do now. And, and he said, he marches because I choose to identify with the, the underprivileged. I choose to identify with the poor. I choose to identify with those who have been left out, left out of the sunlight of opportunity. And if it means I have to struggle a little bit, I'm going that way. If it means I have to die for them, it means I'm going that way. If it means suffering, I'm going that way. If it means sacrificing, I'm going that way. I'm going that way because I heard a voice say, do something for someone. As we turn our tassels, let's go that way and let's do something for someone and let's bring justice. Thank you all.
Ed, you make us proud to do what we do. So thank you.